I don't know exactly why uh, Pastor Hall's reasoning behind, uh, you know, having us preach while he's here, but my theory is that he's trying to give me a heart attack, so I'm not sure. We'll see. <clears throat> he even talked about me passing out two minutes in, so I think he's waiting. He's ready. Um, but uh, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13, it is <clears throat> a privilege, it is an honor to be able to do this, to be able to open God's Word and share the truth with you. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to get up now and walk out, I will completely understand. Um, Pastor Scott even said he, was, he didn't really want to come. He was going to stay home and watch the Lions. The only reason he's here is because he was afraid he was going to lose his job. So, but <laughs> I don't really know if the Lions are worth watching anyways, but you know, whatever. All right, <clears throat> but 1 Corinthians 10, 13 uh, says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege to stand here in this pulpit, Lord, and I pray that you would help me to um, say exactly what you'd have me to say, Lord, no more, no less. I pray that you would help uh, um, call me so that I can... Uh, I can do this, and Lord, I pray that you would just help us to have a, a good time tonight, that we learn uh, something special from you tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in this passage, first of all, we're looking at the word temptation, and the word temptation here has several different meanings. I've used this verse a lot, talking about um, temptation to sin and uh, falling into sin and things like that, which is completely accurate, but it has more than just that meaning. It also is talking about trials and struggles and hardships that we go through in life. And there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And so the first thing I see here is that you're not alone. In whatever you're going through in life, you are not alone. You're not the only one that's gone through it, even though sometimes I know, I know it may seem like you are. It may seem like nobody's ever gone through the specific problem that you're going through and nobody could possibly understand how you feel. Nobody could possibly be able to see from your perspective. But that's not true. The Bible said there's no temptation to you. There's no sin that's overtaken any of us. There's no trials that have overtaken us. There's no struggles we go through. There's nothing that we face that's not common to man that other people haven't also gone through, through, uh, through as well. It's easy to get to the point where we start to think, nobody understands me. And uh, I know that for teenagers, that's very, very common. But if we're honest, as adults, we do exactly the same thing. Say, well, nobody understands how I feel. Nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody, nobody gets me. And if I tried to tell people how I'm feeling, if I tried to tell people the things that I'm going through, people are going to do nothing but judge me. And they're going to hate me. I have to hide these things because... Because nobody understands me. Nobody really understands what I'm going through. I have problems that nobody else has. Don't think you're the only one that struggles with depression, with heartache. Don't think you're the only one that struggles with worrying about your finances. That you're the only one that struggles with relationships in your life. You're not the only one that goes through facing addictions in your life. You're not the only one that has faced sickness and disease in your life. We, it's common. We all go through the same things. And there's people around you who have gone through, through those same exact things. When I was reading this, what I thought of was uh, a time that I, there was a, a child, may, I don't know, maybe three or four years old, that was trying to tie their shoes. And they obviously had no idea how to tie their shoes. And they're twisting it around and making a mess of their shoelaces. And I offered to try to help them tie their shoes, but they were convinced that they were going to do this on their own. And they wanted to figure it out on their own. And many times children will do that. Children will, will decide that I want to do this on my own. You, you're not going to tell me how. I just want to figure this out myself. And they're trying to, but it's never going to happen because they've never been taught. They, they don't know how. They've never done it. But I have. I've, I've tied my shoes and I tie my shoes every day. I don't make my wife tie my shoes for me typically. Um, but <clears throat> I, I tie my own shoes. I'm proud of it. So, but, uh, and I've done that. I know how to do it. So I felt like I could help them. And many times in our life, though, we think that we have to go through our problems by ourselves. We think that we have to face situations alone. We think that, that we can't run to anybody else, we can't find help from anybody else, and we're going to figure this out all on our own. But the fact is, there's other people who have been through the same things that you're going through. 
You know, you're, you're facing a sin problem. I promise you, you're not the first one that's faced that problem. There's other people that have gotten through it. And God tells us in this passage not to make us feel discouraged and make us feel like, well, everybody has problems and life is just so hard and everybody struggles, so we might as well not try. No, he's telling us this because he wants us to see there's other people who have struggled with the same exact problem you have and they made it through. There's other people who face the same temptations that you face and they had victory. There's other people who, who had the same worries that you're having right now, and they overcame those. And, and God wants us to know it's not hopeless. There's other people who have been exactly where you are. In fact, we know that even Jesus himself, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Every temptation, every worry that you face, Jesus faced something similar. Jesus faced temptations. We see as Jesus was uh, tempted by Satan in the desert, and he had to face those temptations just like you and I have to face temptations in our life. And we don't serve a God, we don't serve, serve Jesus who doesn't understand how we feel. He's not a God that doesn't understand how it feels to be tempted. He's not a God that doesn't understand what it feels like to be sick. Not a God that doesn't understand what it feels like to go through troubles because he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He went through all of that. He went through everything it is to be human, yet he never sinned one time. But you know what? We have to humble ourselves. Because what happens a lot of times, unfortunately, is we want to hide the fact that we struggle. We don't want other people to see that side of us. We want people to think everything in our life is perfect. And trust me, you go to Facebook and it seems like everybody's life is just amazing and perfect. And it's like this amazing fantasy story that, man, they're just going through and everything's just phenomenal. And, and we, we feel like we have to act that way sometimes. That we have to show this, this face always smiling and, and everything's right. And hey, how are you doing? Oh, everything's great. God's good. Everything's perfect. I'm not going through anything. You know, just act like everything's great. And the fact is we need to humble ourselves and be able, be able to admit that we do struggle sometimes. We need to be willing to admit that we're not perfect. We, we go through temptations and trials just like anybody else does. And when you realize the fact that everybody around you is in the exactly the same boat you are. You know, we may not all struggle with exactly the same sin. We may not have exactly the same things to worry about in our life. But all of us struggle. We're all in the same boat here. We're all together. And so there's nothing, there's nothing to be ashamed of in being able to admit, hey, I'm struggling. I, I have a problem. I need help. And until you're willing to humble yourself in that way, you're not going to get the help that you need. Pride is what gets in the way of us finding the help that we need more than anything else. Um, sorry. I was talking to my grandpa this afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> I was kind of going over my sermon with him, telling him what I was preaching about, telling him about, about this, and... Uh, and he said, you know, you know, Ryan, that, that's, that's exactly right. Pride stops us from getting the help we need so many times. And he told me how he had seen so many people who would act like everything was fine and they wouldn't be willing to admit that there was a problem. Who he might even go to and try to help them and try to ask them, but they'd reject it, acting like they were fine. They didn't need help. Everything was okay. And those were the people that would end up falling and uh, falling into sin or falling into struggles, and yet, you know what, if, if we're willing to admit that we have problems, if we're willing to admit that we have sin, that's the first step to being able to take care of it. That's the first step to being able to get God's help. And we can go to the people around us and find somebody that you can talk to, because you know, we, we're all in the same boat. We all go through the same things. So the first thing I see here is that you're not alone. And uh, it's, it's so encouraging to know that. You know, the struggles that I face, there's other people in this room that face exactly the same struggles. Except for in this moment, when I'm nervous to be up here preaching, I don't think anybody else is facing that right now. But, you know, <clears throat> that's just me feeling like nobody understands. But, <clears throat> uh, but the second point that I see here is that God is faithful. So not only is there people that have gone through the same things, 
But way more importantly than that, even if nobody else in this room understands you, even if nobody could possibly fathom the problems that you're going through in your life, God is faithful. And we see that right here. It says, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. God is acting as a buffer for you. He's faithful. He's always there. The Bible tells us he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. The Bible says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God wants to help you. God's there for you. He's faithful. He's never, he's never going to be missing. You know, friends, uh, other friends, hu human people, they're, they're great. And it, it's awesome to have somebody who's there for you. But in the end, people will always disappoint you. You know, and uh, people, people aren't perfect. And if you're expecting them to be perfect, then they are going to disappoint you. And people may not always be able to be there, maybe not by their choice. You know, uh, there's people in your life who one day they'll no longer be around. And there's going to be people, there's people in your life who, you know, maybe uh, teenagers, they go to their parents and stuff like that. That's awesome. But, you know, sometimes your parents aren't there. Your parents are at work. Your parents are, um, you know, who knows where. And one day parents won't even be around anymore to be there for you. But there's a person who's always going to be there for you. There's a person that's always going to be faithful. Even if there seems like there's nobody else that's there for you, God is always there for you. He says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God cares for you. God loves you. God's there for you. Isaiah 41 10 says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God says, don't be afraid. I'm there for you. And, you know, at times in our life, these temptations, these trials, these struggles, they cause us to have fear. And we, we, we get scared because we're scared of the unknown. We're scared of what's coming, what's coming next. And 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But you know what? Many of us, we do face that fear. And that fear may look different in each one of our lives, but we face things in our life that scare us. Whether that be the future and what's going to happen in our future, whether that be bills that we have to pay, whether that be relationships that we have and afraid of what's going to happen in that relationship, whether that be our job and afraid of, of, of whether or not we're going to lose our job or get our promotion, whatever it may be with, with our kids. And we're afraid of how, how your kids are going to turn out and what your kids are going to say. And, but you know what we're really afraid of is the unknown. Now, I don't know about, about you guys, <clears throat> but I know that for me, places that are perfectly normal in the day in the light, at night, with the lights off, can become pretty scary. Places like a church or a school or in the middle of the woods or even your very own house. And uh, I remember, now I don't know if this comes with just being the oldest child, but I always remember loving to take advantage of that and scaring people. I love scaring people. Not sure why, but as kids, I would, uh, <clears throat> I would try to hide behind corners as my brother and sister were walking to the bathroom in the middle of the night so I could jump out and scare them. Or, you know, I, I just loved, I loved doing stuff like that. <clears throat> and the reason that things like that are scary, the reason it's scarier in the dark when nobody's around is because we're afraid of what we don't know. We're afraid of what we can't see. We're afraid of what might be around the corner. Now, I, you know, I've had times that I'm, I, especially as a kid, that I'm scared. There's a three-headed monster or something behind the corner. And, you know, I've never one time walked around the corner and been eaten alive by this monster. It's never happened. Okay. <clears throat> but we are afraid of those things. And it, there's, there's no reasoning behind it. It's just we don't know what's around that corner. And because of that, our mind makes up the craziest things that are around that corner. Our mind makes up these giant monsters, maybe a guy with a knife waiting for us, whatever it is, whatever you're scared of something, you know, I know Austin, it'd be a clown back there, right? Which is pretty absurd to me. But, <clears throat> you know, you see something behind the corner and it's your imagination. There's really nothing there. And in life, we do exactly the same thing. When we don't know what's going to happen next, our mind makes up the craziest things of what we think is going to happen. And it scares us. We think, well, you know, well, she didn't text me back. And because of that, I'm sure that she's upset about this. And she's going to talk to so-and-so. And, -so, and I, I know I'm losing my job. My job is just, I'm going to go into work tomorrow. And they're just going to tell me, you need to go home. This is over. And we, we, just, we just hate you. We can't stand you. And I, I just know that's what's going to happen. And it's, it's, a, it's absurd. It's not real. 
But when we don't know what's around the corner, our mind makes these things up and scares us. But we can know is that that fear is not from God. That fear is something that we've made up with our own imagination. Now, <clears throat> I have a confession to make. My, I like scaring my wife as well. You know, I, I don't have my siblings around to scare anymore. So I like to scare my wife. I have, I have started scaring her less. When we first got married, I scared her quite often, but it's been a while. I try to, I'm trying to be good. And actually this was a time where I was trying to be good. I wasn't gonna scare her. But uh, at the time it was before our house was, was finished. So our house was kind of a scary looking place at night. You know, the floors weren't done and it just, you know, it, it, it wasn't a normal looking house yet. And I was in the bathroom. I turned off the light because I knew she was coming and I was gonna jump out of the bathroom and scare her. Now, unbeknownst to me, she was trying to be really sweet. Well, you know, figure she's trying to be sweet and I'm over here trying to scare her. And <clears throat> she was bringing a snack into, into the room for me. She had a, a bowl, I think a bowl of cereal for herself and a bowl of something else for me, holding it in both hands, man. And she was excited to come in there and I was standing in the bathroom and I was going to scare her. I, I did not. This my, I thought, you know what? I'm going to be good. I'm not going to scare her. So I just stepped out of the bathroom and she freaked out. <laughs> and threw the bowls in the air. It was a mess everywhere. And you know, I, it was my fault. I'm sorry. You know. But uh, I was trying to be good. I, didn't, I wasn't planning on scaring her, you know. But, <clears throat> I, but I did, so I'm sorry. And, uh, but the reason that you know, we get scared in situations like that is because we don't know what's coming. And when we, uh, we see something, our mind automatically puts all these thoughts together and assumes the worst. And <clears throat> In life, like I said, in life we do exactly the same thing. But in this verse, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God gives us a few things. He said he doesn't give us the spirit of fear. He doesn't, he doesn't want us to be scared. And something that Pastor Howell says a lot that I love, I, I've said it many, many times since I heard him say it, is don't let fear control you. And because that fear is never from God. That fear is, is never from God. God says God does not give us the spirit of fear. So what does he give us? What does he give us here? And when we look here, the first thing that we see is power. Now, when I, <clears throat> when I think of this power, it's um, the power from God. It's not a power that we have in and of ourselves. It's not like, well, I'm not going to be afraid because I know how strong I am. And whatever is around that corner, man, I'm going to take it out because I'm just so powerful. No, that's not the thought here. We look, Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I am will strengthen thee. It's a strength and a power that comes from God. And when I read this, what I think of is a child. A child that may be <coughs> facing something or someone that's bigger than them, that they have all the right to be afraid of, and they would be afraid of, but because their dad is standing there behind them, they have no fear. And it's not a power that that child thinks that they can somehow overcome this person on their own. Doesn't, they don't think that they can fight off this, this bad guy with their own strength, but they know that because their dad's standing behind them, they don't have anything to be afraid of. You know, and <clears throat> that's, that's exactly the power, the type, of, the type of power that we need to be trusting in. It's not a power of, well, you know what, I'm a good Christian, and because of that, I'm strong enough to fight these temptations. I'm strong enough to take care of these trials on my own. No, we're trusting in a power that comes from God. We're trusting in his strength as he stands behind us. And we know that whatever it is that's facing us, we're strong enough to defeat, not in our own power, but in the power of God. As David stood before Goliath, David did not go in there thinking, man, I am the man I, I have learned how to use this slingshot and I am good at it. So I don't care how big this giant is. I'm going to take him out because I'm just that good. No, that's not, that was not his mindset. His mindset, he said, he was the Lord that I serve is bigger than this giant is. And God's going to defeat this giant for me. Just like God helped me defeat that bear and that lion. He realized it wasn't in his own strength. But a lot of times in life, we, we get through a bear and a lion and we start thinking, that it's us. We think, man, I must be pretty strong to have defeated a bear. Man, I took out a lion. Man, I'm, I'm pretty strong. I'm, pr I'm pretty great. This giant here, I'm going to take care of it. But no, you know what? We can't do it in our own power. We have to trust in the power of God. Not only power, though, we see, secondly, love. 
And uh, if you look at 1 John 14, the Bible says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. You know, when we have the proper love for God and for the people around us, that fear is going to disappear. And when I was reading that about, about the love, what I thought of was a mom that may be in a situation that typically she would be afraid, but because she has her child with her, her love for her child supersedes that fear. And she's not afraid anymore because all she cares about is her child. All she cares about is the love that she has for that child. And whatever it is that's, that's coming her way, she doesn't care because she loves her child. And you know what? Perfect love is going to cast out fear. If we love God the way that we need to, if we love people around us the way that we need to, then you know what? You're going to stop worrying about what's going to happen at your job because your job doesn't matter that much compared to God. You're going to stop worrying about, about what so-and-so is going to say because it doesn't really matter what other people think because you're focused on God. And if our love is where it needs to be, if we have a love for God like we need to, those fears are going to disappear. And you know what? The, the Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And the more that you love God, the more you're going to know that he loves you. The more time you spend with God, the more you're going to realize how much he loves spending time with you. The more that you, you want to be with God, the more you're going to realize he wants to be with you. And if you love God properly, it's going to help you know, you know what? God loves me so much that he's not going to let anything happen to me. And that love is going to cast out all fear. The third thing that <clears throat> I see here in uh, 2 Timothy is a sound mind. God gives us a sound mind. Opposed to fear, he gives us a mind that thinks clearly. You know, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. We need to get to the place where we trust God enough that whatever it is that's around the corner, we allow him to give us a sound mind about. And you know, I said a lot of those things, we, we're scared of them because we don't know what's going to happen. And what happens typically is 99.999% of the time, what we're afraid of never comes into being and isn't even real. It's just something we made up in our own mind. And so if you have a sound mind, a mind that's thinking clearly, that's trusting in God, you're not going to have that fear. You're not going to be afraid of these things. And, you know, it makes me think of, you know, some people this time of year like to go to haunted houses and things like that. And uh, the reason that those places are scary is because when people walk into there, they suspend their disbelief. Basically, they allow themselves to believe that this stuff is real. Now, I know some people will walk through there not being scared at all and, you know, talking to the people at the haunted house and stuff and, uh, my theory is that they're more afraid than anybody else, really, and they're just trying to hide it. But <clears throat> uh, you, you allow yourself to believe that it's real. And because of that, it causes you to be scared. And in the same way, you know, we allow ourselves to believe things in our life are real. We, well, you don't understand. This is a real problem. This, this is right. And, and really, there's nothing there. And if we have a sound mind, we'll realize even when there is a problem in front of us, God's going to take care of it. The Bible says, take no thought on the morrow. The morrow shall take thought on itself. And God's going to be there. God's going to take care of it. And we, we, we take so much time worrying about what's going to happen next. We just need to realize God is faithful. And he's going to be there. He's going to be there to give you the power that you need to take care of whatever problem you face. He's going to be there to love you and to show you what perfect love really is so that you don't have to be afraid. He's going to give you a sound mind. But we need to remember that God is faithful. And then uh, thirdly, God is going to give you relief. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, There hath no temptation you taken, uh, no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God makes a promise to us here. He says every problem that comes in your life, every time you're tempted with sin, every time that there's a trial that you're facing, God has already made a way of escape for you. And you know what? That way of escape may not necessarily be exactly where we want it to be. 
Say, well, I want, the, I want it to be right here. I want my exit to be right here. I can't stand this any longer. Well, God says, he's not going to try you with more than you're able to bear. And he's going to give you a way of escape. Sometimes it may feel like it's at the last possible second before you can't bear it any longer. But God makes a promise that before it gets to the breaking point, he's going to give you a way of escape. He's going to give you a way out. And so when you're facing sin and when you're facing trials, when you're facing temptations, when you're facing struggles in your life, go to God and know that God, know that God is going to be there for you. Know that God is always going to give you a way of that way of escape. And if we if we trust that, then that fear is going to that fear is going to disappear. We, we don't need to be worried about what's going to happen tomorrow because whatever problem comes tomorrow, God's going to give us a way of escaping it. And this verse has always been so encouraging to me because whenever I'm going through a problem, I can know that God is going to give me that way of escape, that God is going to let me out. It's not going to last forever. The pain that you're going through, one day, God's going to rescue you from it. The, the sin that you may be facing, if you allow God to do a work in your life, he's going to rescue you from that sin. But many times what happens is God gives us a way after way after way of escape, but we're too prideful to take, to take God's way. And we try to fix our problem ourselves, and we say, well, it, I got this. It's going to be okay. I can take care of my own problems. I can fight my own sin on myself. Nobody needs to tell me how, how to take care of my temptations. I can fight this on my own. And God gives you way after way after way that you can escape places that you can, you can pull off on the exit. And yet you keep going down that path because you don't trust God. You're just trusting yourself. <clears throat> so our job is not to create a way of escape. Our job is just to trust God and to follow him. And many times we, we try to create our own exits and we try, to, we try to do our own thing. We think, well, if I do this, it's going to fix my problem. If I talk to this person and do this and this, it's going to fix my problem. No, your job is to trust God. Your job is to depend on God. And he promises that he is going to give you that way of escape. He promises that you are going to be able to bear it. But our job is just to trust him and to go to him. <coughs> um, so this passage, it, it tells us that every temptation we go through is something normal that other people have gone through as well. You don't need to feel like you're alone. You need to humble yourself. And really, it, it boils down to humility. You know, every single point here boils down to humility because first you need to humble yourself and realize, you know what, I'm not the only person that's gone through this. I, I don't need to have such a focus on myself. Pastor Monty, he said something that I thought was really good. He, he said, he was talking about people worrying about what other people think and stuff. And he said, you know what? I, I have something to tell you. The only person whose universe revolves around you is you. And uh, sometimes that, that's how we think. Our universe, the, we think everything revolves around us. We think, well, you know, if everybody just needs to stop what they're doing and understand how hard my life is and come and help me because nobody, nobody else goes through what I go through. Nobody else hurts the way, I, the way I do. Nobody else faces temptations like I do. And everybody just needs to understand that, understand how hard my life is. But no, you know what? You need to humble yourself and realize it's not all just about you. We, we all are in the same boat here. Yeah, we need to help each other. But we need to help each other. You're not just expecting it for everybody else. You, you, you're, you're to help the people around you as well because we're all in an even playing field here. We're all in the same boat. We all have the same issues. And then you need to humble yourself before God and know that God is faithful. And uh, my grandpa said something else. He said, every time you pray, it's an act of humility. And you know what? Sometimes that may not be true about how we're praying. But it should be. And when we go before God, realizing that, God, I cannot do this myself. I need your help. The problem that I'm facing is too big for me. The sin that I'm struggling with in my life is too big for me to face alone. And I need your help. Going to God in humility and realizing he's the only one that can help us. And being humble enough not to trust our own ways not to trust our own methods, which are always going to seem to make sense to us, but to trust God's methods, to trust God's way. And God promises if we do that, he is going to help us. We're never going to go through anything 
that we can't bear. And it's such an encouraging thought to me to know that whatever I go through in my life, God's always there for me. He's always going to give me a way of escape. And my job is just to be humble and to realize, you know, what, I do have a problem to be able to admit that, to be able to humble myself and go to God and ask him for the help that I need. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to um, speak tonight, Lord. And I pray that you would help us each to humble ourselves before you, Lord. I thank you that you've revealed to us, Lord, that whatever we're going through, it's common to man, Lord, that we all go through the same things, Lord. And I know that's an encouragement to me. And I pray that you would just help us to not try to be a Pharisee and hide who we really are, Lord, but that we would come before you and humble ourselves, Lord, and realize that we have problems and we need you to help us fix them. Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with the invitation, that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen.